When my daughter was three, we bought one of those butterfly kits. Maybe you've seen them, but if not, they send you a little jar with caterpillar food and eggs. The caterpillars hatch out and eat all the food and then create their chrysalis on top of the jar lid. After a certain number of days, you put the lid in a big mesh container where the butterflies can safely emerge. Our five caterpillars did everything they were supposed to do, but one of them built a chrysalis that was a little wonky. Just looking at it, you knew this one wouldn't make it. At that time, my son was 11, and when he saw it, he immediately said, Mom, we've got to put, take that one out. Sydney will be so sad if she sees it die. My heart broke a little. He was only 11 and already understood death well enough to anticipate grief, to want to shield his little sister from it. But I also held firm. It will be sad, I told him, but death is a natural part of life. It won't be easier for her later in life if we keep her from seeing the butterfly die now. And so we moved that chrysalis with the other ones and we all hoped it would be okay. But then we grieved with Sydney when that butterfly didn't make it. What AJ did was a healthy response to death. He anticipated the sadness. He considered his past heartache and anticipated what life would be like if the butterfly died. Anticipatory grief can be a very healthy way to prepare for a difficult situation. It's Palm Sunday. At the beginning of this service, we normally reenact Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But then, as the service goes on, we very quickly face a different story in the Gospel. Seemingly out of the blue, we move straight into the Passion, the whole story of Jesus' trial, crucifixion, and death. It's a full week before Easter, and still days before Good Friday, when we will commemorate the death and crucifixion of Jesus, why do we hear the whole passion on Palm Sunday? Well, I wonder if it's a way to walk with Jesus' grief. Jesus knows what's coming. He has tried to tell his disciples what will happen, but they struggle to believe the truth. We are walking with Jesus at this time, knowing what will come. Often we talk about following the way of Jesus, and in this reading, we are following Jesus in the anticipation of his death. Perhaps there's a sense of fear or dread, but Jesus did not linger in anxiety of the worst case scenario. Jesus continued to preach the kingdom of God. It is a very hard path Jesus followed, but he did not waver as he did what was called of him. I imagine by now, most of you have seen the COVID-19 curves. You know the ones, the big red curve if we do nothing, the lower curve if we all shelter in place. It's hard to watch the news or look at a social, uh, social media without seeing it shared on a screen. These curves are trying to give us a story, a narrative of what happens if we don't follow directions. They are telling us in advance that while everything still seems almost okay right now, we're about to face the really hard part of this situation. In the simplest terms possible, scientists are trying to tell us to prepare for a crisis. That's really important. But what I want to remind you is that those graphs are not forever. Whether they are three weeks or three months, they only show a short period of time. There will be a time after the pandemic, just like there was a time after the 1918 flu pandemic, just like there was a time after the plague, and just like there was a time after Jesus' crucifixion. In a reflection from presiding Bishop Michael Curry last week, he considered the ministry of Jesus in the weeks before his trial. Ta taking some time to reflect on the gospel stories relative to modern events brought Bishop Curry to a new understanding about Jesus' ministry. 
Jesus was preaching in a time of crisis. His ministry occurred when Israel was occupied by a foreign nation under the cruel dictates of an emperor that just wanted to control their land. The whole of what Jesus preached was to a people existing in a kind of lockdown from their normal way of life. Now, to be clear, what I have had to give up in my first world privileged home is nothing compared to the sacrifices of the marginalized in the time of Jesus. But as we bear our cross of uncertainty, we can acknowledge that the transitions we're going through are hard without minimizing the suffering of others. In fact, when we acknowledge our own fear and grief, we are better equipped to help others in need. As we hunger down in our new re reality, considering that Jesus was teaching and preaching during a time of crisis, we have the new insights on familiar, new opportunity. We have the opportunity for new insights on familiar texts. Jesus recognized that the marginalized were, are especially vulnerable to abuse and oppression in times like these. In Bishop Curry's reflection, he noted that even as Jesus walked toward Jerusalem and his death, he gave us clear direction for how to respond. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. As we enter a holy week unprecedented in our lifetimes, we can hold fast to the knowledge that our story ends with resurrection. As we bear our own crosses of uncertainty and grief, we can respond to the commandment to call the call to love our neighbor as ourselves. As we shelter at home, we are reminded that God is always active and present in the world. We know that even during a crisis, no, especially during a crisis, Jesus walked among us, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Friends, fear not. God is always at work. Amen.